if that makes sense. So, like, I see your point, but also I think that you can be a chess player and not, like, be overly obsessed with every single piece, but use that knowledge to be more selective about how you're moving. Yeah. You would be a checkers player and I'd be a yeah, chess no, player for because sure, I I'm, get really into, like, Yeah, and I'm more like, let's get to this point. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. It, so it requires context. Yeah. He flopped. Okay. There's people that can't do pressure. Alexis is the type to be like, you know what, like, we're all playing baseball. It's just... You know, I'm the major leagues. Y'all are the minor leagues, you know? And y'all are the practice team. Y'all yeah. throw the ball. It's like, it's not a big like deal. It, y'all got the same amount of skills. Just, you know, who has it, who doesn't. And like, everybody has their day. Yeah, Mine, yeah. Mine's already came. Like, Mine is just every day. It's not every day. Mine are just the days that end in Y. <laughs> That's a really good one. <laughs> It's okay. Know. It's okay. Yeah, it Just is. own it. Just own it and embrace it. It's fine. It's okay to be confident, bro. It is. I have like selective competitiveness. Like if I'm doing good, I'm not competitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm stuck. I'm like this game is trash anyway. Yeah, I don't even. I don't even play this. Three, two, one. Welcome back to the Sandbar with your friendly neighborhood MC Sandy Paulino, and joining us today are J and J. No, you got Jennifer Paulino and Jenny Ramos. Uh, Jens, um, let's start off by saying that. That's usually what happens. The Jens? Yeah, that's usually how that starts. And usually we are a lot more coordinated unintentionally. So Yeah, we should have a slogan and some t-shirts. We should. Yeah. We come as a package item when you just want things to be magical. So this episode is going to be magical. You know um, the vibes. So yeah, I'm Jennifer. And I'm Jenny Lee. And we're the Jens, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so many of you already know Jennifer Paulino, uh, but today we have a different guest, Jenny. So Jenny, tell us about yourself. So as we mentioned, Jay, Jenny, whichever one, um, I am Dominican. Very proud. I'm not born there, unfortunately, but you know, we still proud. Um, but I'm originally from the Bronx, New York, right by Yankee Stadium. So that's what we rep, mm, um, okay. mostly because we have yeah. no choice. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for, for repping yeah, us today. Yeah. Um, oh, but yeah, you already know the vibes. New York, born and raised. Um, but I went to Temple, Temple University with Jennifer. We were college roommates, so that's how we know yeah. each other. But I studied marketing and business at the Fox School of Business. And I got my master's in tourism and hospitality management. Mm. So, you know, a two degree mommy out yeah. here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I have now grown and become an experienced curator, so mm, we're out okay. here. I want everybody to know that if you ever need something to be like highly coordinated, Jenny is your person. Like she the is the the planner of events. Yes, I am like obsessed with logistics. I consider myself a logistics queen. I like to like come up with strategy, look at things from the top, and figure it out and make it make sense. So I that's just my want thing. Everybody that she has Slack channels for her personal life. I just I'm gonna keep putting that out there. She is constantly. What do you, mean you have Slack channels? Okay, so <laughs> I don't know why you always put me on the spot with this, but essentially, hilarious. I think it's really effective. Okay, so we have to use Slack for work. I'm sure people are familiar with Slack. Like it's a platform you can use it to chat, to put documents in there, track stuff, whatever. I personally feel like we use it for work every day and it helps us stay in touch and organize things and there's different channels. Why can't I use that for my relationship for us to keep ourselves organized? <laughs> like, I feel, I'm being serious. It's the same thing with meetings. Like, we have meetings all day and I'm like, for all of this, I could also schedule meetings with my friends and make sure that it's just as scheduled as the rest of my work life. Yeah. So, I created a Slack channel for me and my boyfriend Whoa. and <laughs> it's great though. It helps so much. Like, obviously, we were apartment hunting. Um, mm -hmm. We just signed our lease but we were apartment hunting and like we have a, a channel for the apartment we were tracking all the different <laughs> listings in there all the couches all the things that we want and like we talk business in there through we have like a legal documents channel i threw our lease up there like it helps us like we had a puerto rico channel we were planning our trip like you know i think it's great it helps us stay organized so like if <laughs> so if if you guys are like talking about the apartment apartment hunting and whatnot and and your your, your man's is like Oh, you know, like, what do you want to get from the grocery store? Like, uh, uh, uh. That's the food channel. channel. And you know what? Absolutely. I do do that. <laughs> and he hates it. But I, listen, we have to stay organized. He, the other day, I think he asked me about, like, his driving lessons, like, on the apartment channel. I was Whoa, like, you have what? to put this in general. <laughs> like, you either have to put this in general or random. This is going to mess up the flow. When I go to look through the apartment stuff, we're going to have this yeah. randomly in here. That doesn't work. So, yes, I... Wow. Do you, like, delete the things that don't 
Go in the channel. You know what? I, I don't delete it because, like, I'm not going to be rude, but I will say that I respond in the proper channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I respond in the proper channel. I'm That's trying to, I'm trying to, like, lead through example and try to, like, you know, get him used to, like, Doing the just, right just thing. ignore, just ignore it. Didn't happen, you know. We're gonna, we're gonna move this conversation where it belongs. Yeah, it's all, been effective. All jokes aside, though, everybody has their quirks. Cause like my man's here, like really color coordinates his clothes and like folds his t-shirts in a way that he can see the front, so that well, it's I, almost in like filing cabinet style. I don't color coordinate. All right? How often my, do you keep my, up with that? My hangers are black and white. So I have a black one and a white one. You know, like that. You can say that, but that's just you know that's just like an aesthetic thing. You know, it's not necessarily out of necessity, but I do. Does he get angry if it's out of place? Yes, actually. <laughs> it makes him really upset. Like, if he puts his cup right here and you move the cup to here, he will be very agitated. I just, just move the cup back. <laughs> no, You're but like, that, like, that thing. supposed to be how they are. No, I just, you know, I want to. The thing is, when I was younger, I used to lose stuff all the time. Okay. So then I started kind of putting everything in a specific place so that if it wasn't in that place, I knew it was. Like, I knew I had to look for it. Yes. Or you knew yeah. that it was lost and not just, yeah. like, misplaced. So you're exactly. like, no, I have this habit. Yeah, exactly. I'm like that. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So, like, if my wallet isn't in the specific spot where I put it on, I have, like, a little little holder for it. If it's not in there, I know I lost it. Yeah. Or, like, I know I need to go find it. But See, um, I've never lost yeah. too many things. Or yeah. I've lost and never realized that I... <laughs> Jenny is joining us today <laughs> to talk about something that has been sort of a hot topic something that needs to be talked about if it hasn't been talked about enough and that is afro latinidad we are all three dominican but this applies to many different latinx cultures and uh, as far as where we all come from we all have different stories different situations me being a uh, dominican male them being not only dominican females but also in the environment that they grew up on, two very different environments, and where we studied. I think a lot, at least in my experience, I was able to connect with my Latinidad during college because where I grew up was very Caucasian, very American. Even it, I, most of my circle were, um, I had a lot of African American friends, a lot of black friends. I had a couple, you know, I had white friends growing up, but kind of towards the end of high school, it started diminishing a little bit because you start to realize certain things, certain things don't line up and you kind of, you know, you find your spots. But when I got to college, it was, uh, I think we were talking about this before and you called it a culture shock. Mm -hmm. So Jenny, if you could get into how you had that experience at Temple. No, absolutely. I think it's funny that you had your experience from that perspective because I had a culture shock with the opposite experience. Mm. Like, I grew up, obviously, in New York, the Bronx, the Heights. Mm. I went to school with people that looked like me, sounded like me, and I was always in my culture and in my comfort zone in high school and in middle school and everywhere I was. So when I, like, I never realized that there was something to, like, get to know nah, or that yeah, there yeah. was, like, something about being Dominican or Hispanic that even, like, was worth talking about because mm. it was just normal. Yeah. So, like, when we got to college, I don't know if you remember, like, people were asking about our accents and, like, our food. And I was like, what are you talking about? I didn't even know that I had an accent mm. because everybody sounded like me. For me, my parents used to be like, oh, you sound like a gringa. Like, <laughs> you, yeah. this fancy girl over here with her mm. fancy accent. So I thought I was good. And then I got to school and people couldn't understand me. And I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> so I think definitely when I got to college for the opposite reason, I was very pushed to be like, all right, like, now I have to explain to people where I'm from from what that means where our people are about and I didn't have a lot of answers because like I said like nobody actively talked about it we just lived it so I started doing research I started looking for people that sounded like me like I was very intense about finding community because I got to temple and oh, the original yeah, was yeah I like I feel like I like heard her accent somewhere I was like hey you <laughs> hang out with me you sound Dominican <laughs> <laughs> really, we I went to my first ever. This is my first ever meeting for the Association of Latino Students, and we were doing an which ice we breaker. became the presidents of. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, I got up and I was like, "Oh, I'm Dominican," and Jenny was like, "Oh." I'm Dominican too. And I looked at her and I was like, oh wow, she's really excited about being Dominican. And then I kid you not, she followed me outside. Yes. yes, yes. I was like really socially awkward. So I like tried to leave before I, anybody would talk to me. And Jenny comes up to me and she goes, 
you're Dominican and you live in Whitehall, we have to be friends. Take my number. And I was just I like. I think I like asked her to be my roommate like the first day. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, it, was like, it was like a month uh, later. But, you know, yeah. she did ask me to go to a basketball game with her like yeah. day two of meeting her. And I was like, oh, my God, she wants yeah. to be my friend. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, but I was so obsessed with creating a community because I got there and it felt very like white or black. Like, mm-hmm. that's it. Yeah. Like, people, we got there and they were like, we going to a black party or we going to a white party? What vibe are you with? And mm-hmm. I was like, that's that's it. That's like, all we there's got. No, there's no <laughs> white <child. laughs> Really important to, like, go back to because if I recall the community that you started building and how different it was, because when you started building community, you started building a community of women that looked and sounded like yes. you. Yes. But then that ended up blowing up yes. entirely because oh my God. while they didn't look like like you and they did sound like you and had similar backgrounds their ideologies and their way of thinking and their backgrounds like just cult like uh et- etiquette wise mm-hmm. i guess you could say or their way of thinking was so different yes absolutely and it's funny because i mean I guess it was like a test drive at building community when I had first got there as a freshman because we didn't join the association, I think, until like the second year and like really get active. Mm -hmm. But the first year was really a test drive because I was really trying to recreate what I had at home. Like I went to an all girls school. I was I had a little all. Yeah, I went to all girls Catholic school and I had a little crew. I had a little all girl crew. So I got to temple and I was like, all right, y'all look like the friends that I had back home. (laughs) Like I'm going to need y'all to come with me. We all got to hang out every day. We're going to have lunch. And I like I was trying to create that community and like because it was forced i think it just like blew up in my face mm-hmm. but like as i started learning more and getting more in touch and really trying to connect and started kind of like getting together with people that were like minded kind of like jennifer we started actually building a community that really like mattered and that really was impactful and that honestly people like after we created that organization like built it up people were re- we didn't create it but we built it up yeah, <laughs> um, people were really thanking us for creating that space for them to get to know themselves and even like get to know other people because when people got a temple like there was no hub there was no diversity hub there was no groups that were actively like out doing any outreach in our communities like nobody knew where the hispanics were like anytime we met any latinos hispanics anybody like they were like yo y'all was here the whole time <laughs> y'all exist yeah. yo, for real. we're not isolated alone. before <laughs> yeah it's kind of like you guys all crashed on a plane in temple <laughs> yeah. and then you're like slowly finding each other yes yeah. and the yeah. thing is like it was exactly that because it was like if i heard an accent if you heard the music you were like <laughs> i would drive i would like be in a car and like try to have the music loud so the yeah. If I saw somebody <laughs> looking to the side, I was like, hey, you, yeah. come join our organization. Yeah. yeah, that's hilarious. It was an intersectionality piece to the work that we did because I came from a background of like just straight, like white or black. Mm. Right as black because that was the closest mm. thing that I had to yeah. me that looked like me. And at home, my family was Dominican, but I kind of had a separation of like church and state. Like I was Latino with friends and then I was everything else with everybody else. Like for the most part, I was black for the mo- like the way I carried myself mm-hmm. and the way that I interacted with people and the things that I gravitated to. So, for example, I went to a lot of Latino events, but you would more than likely catch me at a black party or you would catch me at a BSU meeting or something else that was like black culture wise, because that's what I felt most comfortable in versus like some of my other Latino friends were like, can I even go in that room with you? And I would be like, mm-hmm. what? Like, why see, is that a question? No, but that makes sense. And I think that's why I was so rebellious in terms of like not wanting to pick a side because I never had to. Mm. So to me, I was very uncomfortable. Like I very much did, I like, I didn't have to like go like and pretend to be or like just fall into a blacker crowd before. So when I got to temple, like I felt very uncomfortable in just the black space and I felt extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> Even more so in just a white space. Because I just, like, I don't know. Like, I'm not enough of either. And I think that's the confusing part and the complicated part about being Latino in general. That it's like, you don't fit in any yeah. bucket. Yeah. And especially in America, like, the way that race is even structured, first of all, it's not even real. It's just like, you look like this, we're going to go with that. Sounds good. And I feel like the way that it's structured forces you to pick a side. And because our culture does not in any way, shape, or form, like, align with that, it's so complicated of an experience experience for us because you feel like you have to choose but you don't feel comfortable in any decision that you make yeah we're like in we're like in limbo because when i was when i was in high school i went to the same high school as my sister but fortunately when i got there was a little more diverse you start to kind of before i got into that identity crisis of trying to fit into one or the other i found myself just kind of being me you know just and subconsciously i hadn't 
uh, categorize myself in either group. Because when I got there, there was a couple more brown kids. You know, I mm-hmm. had this weird bond with a lot of the Indian kids at my school. <laughs> there was like, there's like three or four Indian kids that it was just we didn't even hang out all That's the time. You look ambiguous. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, and then we kind of just, just had that connection. Yeah. We had that connection, <laughs> and and then later on in high school, I was um, I I said this before, but a lot of people thought I was black until I spoke Spanish. And then I was a spicy black guy, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> right? And, and I only knew uh, when I, I guess, through all of high school, I only knew one or two other Dominicans in my entire school, and like my, my entire district, whatever class. And senior year, there was a, a couple more, but I was I wasn't I wasn't close friends with any other Dominican in my entire school district. Uh, there was a lot of Puerto Ricans. There was uh, there was a Cuban friend I had. But I never felt as though I needed to be, like, Dominican. You know, there was mm-hmm. no, you know, Dominican Sandy. It was just kind of <laughs> like I was just Sandy. And then when I got to college, um, when I was in Maryland, I, we had a lot of kind of international kids because I was, you know, baseball. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we had some Venezuelan kids. We had some, a Puerto Rican guy. We had a couple Puerto Ricans, um, some from Florida, some from Puerto Rico. And there was like two or uh, two or three other Dominicans. So and these like we're talking people that are like Latinx, like Spanish speaking. Some of them yeah. like my one of my closest Venezuelan friends, like he's straight up like accent speaking Spanish more than he speaks English. So and I they're kinda, like culture. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were like it's, it's kind of like they were like bombarding me with culture. Mm-hmm. And I was like I had like this internal feeling where I'm I'm. You know, I need to be Dominican. You know, I need to I need to show out. I need to represent. Yeah, yeah, sort of. I mean, I started that kind of like in high school because I joined the um the the Spanish club. Did enough. Yeah. <laughs> in case the credentials <laughs> weren't enough. <laughs> yeah. So when I got there, they were they would like come at me for my my broken Spanish, and I'm like, you see, yeah. you can do good anywhere you go. Yeah, exactly. No were, yeah, and I'm and at that point, I didn't. You know, you go to DR and you kind of notice. You know, mm-hmm. they're like, ah, you're speaking American Spanish. But for me, I thought my Spanish here was good enough. So then I got with them. And, and whenever so, you meet an American, they're like, can you teach me, please? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Por exactly. favor. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then they're like coming at me and speaking, you know, Venezuelan Spanish. They're speaking Puerto Rican Spanish. They're speaking Cuban Spanish. And I'm like, yo, like, I need to, I need to speak some good Spanish. I can't have these dudes showing me up. And I'm hanging out with them every day. So then now I have uh, first year, all of my roommates were white. And then we there was um he was El Salvadorian and Mexican I'm pretty sure I had another roommate that joined our because we were like in a house he joined kind of later in the year mm-hmm. but for the most part I was still in that white space that I was used to so I hadn't had that pressure but then when I started hanging out with the Latino kids it was like you know I gotta be able to contribute to the culture they're making references I need to make my own references I started listening to more music I started speaking more Spanish than English I started kind of like you had to do some research yeah yeah yeah, right yeah (laughs) yeah and it was kind of like this unspoken pressure that I felt Mm -hmm. and at like at from one perspective you can kind of if you want to come at it from a sensitive side they were kind of bullying me into my Dominicanness but from my perspective, it was like, you know, I want to be cool with these dudes. They're really, like, looking out for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, g- bigger than that, they were my real friends. You know, they, we were hanging out every day. Uh, there was a lot of times where we would sleep over at each other's place. And kind of that became the, the, the crew, almost. And it was just this me coming into my, like, my full self. So now I had to balance... After I had gotten, I guess, my second year in Maryland, I had really been through the whole kind of, like, initiation of becoming Dominican. <laughs> if were ever yeah. 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 It's like, if there yeah. was, Jenny would have yeah. built it. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then when you go to DR, now going to DR was different for me. Now it's like, I need to reconnect with my, with mm-hmm. my foundation. Like, those, those, like, next two or three years, now I'm, I got to really be intentional about the Spanish I speak. I need to really connect with my roots. And, you know, then I got to be like, all right, I got to chill, though. You know, I'm not off the boat. I'm not, you know, for lack of a better word, I'm not from Dominican Republic physically. I can't act like I'm... Oh, you weren't born in Dominican Republic? No, I wasn't Republic. born there. Oh, weren't you born in Germany? Yeah. I was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. German, so. yeah. So I, c- I can't be acting, like, I can't be out here pretending as if you I'm have to be some yourself. sort of... Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I got to balance it out and just be me. So that, I was coming down from that. 
And ever since then, I've been a little more comfortable where I am in society. But up until I had gotten into that environment with them, I was uh, just, I was kind of like a blank slate almost. I was just kind of fitting in wherever I fit. So I have a question. Do you think that it would have been different if those um, Latinos that you were around weren't like straight, like, I guess, like born and raised in those countries, like from the islands? Do you feel like if they were also like, I guess, what is it, like Dominican American or whatever American, like that they would, that it would have been a different type of pressure or no pressure at all? I think it would have been a little less pressure because the thing was also where they came from. Like the the Venezuelan dudes also came from Miami. Mm -hmm. So even though it's still America, they keep kind of like how you grew up in the Bronx. They mm-hmm. keep that that culture within each other. So their Spanish is still not like it's not broken. Like they mm-hmm. have that. Maybe it's different from their home country. But for me, it was like straight up no like no jokes. Spanish, Spanish. So I think to your point, if they would have been, I guess, more Americanized, I would have been more chilling. You know, I could have mm-hmm. slid through, slid past. You would have coasted. Things. Yeah, I would have been able to coast a little better, but. I'm I'm glad that they were more in tune with their culture than I was cuz otherwise I wouldn't have I probably wouldn't be who I am right now. No, that makes sense and the reason why I asked that question is cuz I feel like um when you're from the island there's a different level of pride and also like the way that we have to learn american history is the way that they learn their history yeah exactly so i feel like especially and i think i've talked about this before but i feel like when you go to like when you're from the island it's such a community feel and it's such like you just live it like every day and people are so proud whereas here like we don't have to do all of that because we can coast like kind of like you mentioned like just just being like hey i'm this person is enough you don't have to like prove yourself so I think when you combine those two worlds that maybe it's like, oh, I have to kind of step my game up. Because I'll be honest, even when I met you in college, I was like, dang, she extra Dominican. (laughs) I always thought that. So first of all, I always felt like I didn't have a place because I I my identity crisis is a lifetime crisis for me. Like there was no culture shock for me. Okay. Because growing up, I, first of all, I grew up in a military environment for all of elementary school, which was really diverse. Um, And so, like, I met kids, like, one of my best friends growing up, well, my group of best friends, um, my Theo Eddie, he was Jamaican and his wife was Puerto Rican and their kids were mixed. So they, I grew up with them. I grew up with other kids, um, my other group of friends, they were Ecuadorian and Panamanian and then, but they were very American so it was like there was a sense of Latini that to me, I was born in DR and all of my cousins were born here. So I was always kind of like that straight off the boat, like very Dominican, whose dad told her when I was like elementary school, like you can't claim to be Dominican if you don't know your history. Cause he was trying to quiz me on like the founding fathers. And I was like, I don't know that. See, I didn't, and I didn't he was like, that. what's the <laughs> national <laughs> anthem? That's not like, the you got. I'm just, I'm just a baseball player. <laughs> <laughs> I had to learn baseball. all of these things. Cause my dad literally told me I couldn't claim to be Dominican if I didn't know these things. And mm-hmm. so I went and like okay. tried to figure it out. And so by the time I met you, I was like, comfortable with my level of Dominican because I knew my history <laughs> but like as you remember I, definitely I couldn't dance like my bachata skills my salsa skills none of that was there like you taught me how to dance a lot <laughs> of what I like now know like there was a lot of stuff that like culturally like it, when we talk about culture we talk about like the music the mm-hmm. food like I could cook but I couldn't cook Dominican food like my sazon was not like Mom, my mom's sasso. Well, I don't think that and either of us are ever going to get to that level. Let's right. just put that out the there. Sasso, there's a difference between sauce and sasso. Like, no. I, just, <laughs> for, I just feel like that takes a different type yeah. of, like, I would need, like, to be cooking in leña in, like, a callejón oh, yeah. somewhere. Oh, like, yeah. I learned how to cook in leña in the campo, but Oh, it's now still, you different, yeah. sis. Like, yeah, but that's, even then, it's, there's a there's something that can't be replaced. Exactly. There's something. Yeah. yeah. There's just, there's a level of... Like resourcefulness and like, yeah, like a, yeah, you know, like you can get it done, or you can, you know, you can get it done. Yeah, know. we're not there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I feel like for me, it was my like identity was always kind of like questioned because I was always very comfortable with being black. Mm-hmm. I remember being comfortable when I would hear people like Dominicans say, "Oh, yo soy blanco oscuro." I'd be like, "But you black." Like, I'm not, I'm confused. They what does that white, even they mean? They dark white. Like, what <laughs> does that mean? Sense. It never made sense to me because yeah. I was always token black person. 
Like, nobody knew what Dominican was after, like, because gotcha. I grew up in a very diverse environment where yeah, diversity comes, meant that, you were black or white. That comes from the, the anti-blackness, though, you know? Yeah. There's a, there's a whole situation. There's a, it's, like, deeply embedded into our history. Yeah, But absolutely. before we get into that, since yeah, while we're still we're, on the, the topic of, of where we come from, what about code switching? So when I got to college, I was told that I wasn't black enough, and I was very confused. I was like, what do you mean I'm not black enough? Like, what do you what do you mean? Like, I was very confused when I would go to meetings with, and like, yeah, let's say like BSU or other like organizations where I would talk about blackness as it related. And they were like, but bro, you're Dominican. And I would be like, I'm confused. See, you came in proud. I was on the complete opposite spectrum. I was like, so ignorant to all of that like i and kind of like we were talking about like anti-blackness and all of that i literally had no idea that i was black or that dominicans are black i honestly yeah I, in my head like before i came and i understood the difference between you know your ethnicity and your nationality and your race i was like i'm dominican where is that on the checklist like y'all got that <laughs> yeah, why yeah. there's no boss for us like yeah, where's yeah. that yeah. like i thought dominican was a race like i was ready to <laughs> yeah. i was ready to die on that hill yeah. <laughs> So, like, it took a lot of educating and learning. And then, but, like, that's the thing. The reason why we feel that way and why there's still Dominicans that are like, no, we're not black, we're yeah. not white, we're Dominican. And we're like, there's so many more levels yeah, to that. Yeah. It's yeah. because of our upbringing. Because, like, that's not, and nobody in my family talked about being black. Like, that's not yeah. about that. It's more about the skin tones and about that kind of stuff. But nobody is like, oh, we're black. You you never heard no. that. It was but just, I, like, claiming Dominican, Dominican, Dominican. Yeah. And I think that's the thing where we think about colorism and the diversity in the latinx community in such a like blanket way mm -hmm. that we can't so like when i got to college and i realized that i wasn't black enough i then had to unlearn what i thought was you're either this or you're either that mm -hmm. and i had to learn the privilege that i had mm -hmm. of being dominican because i didn't realize that there is a level of light there was light skin privilege yes. that that was not something that like for me yes i'm darker and i can consider myself black but i'm not you like you're darker than me mm -hmm. so there's a level of my light skinness that, that, that gives me privilege <laughs> over you in some areas because mm -hmm. to some people I might not be as threatening um, when it comes to threatening. So let me back up and refrain, refine that blackness is threatening in some spaces. So I am less threatening mm. because I am lighter to some people, mm -hmm. which is problematic in itself, but I didn't realize that was a privilege. Mm -hmm. And so when people at temple told me you're not black, I was like, what do you mean? and they were like nah bro like you kind of like and the thing is that it gets even more complicated because that's where the reason why we feel that way and we're like confused is because our thought processes of like the american concept and view on race and color and all of that is very different than the dominican yeah. one. Mm -hmm. like in the dominican republic like we are just talking skin tones here yeah, like we yeah. are not talking race we are not no. talking ethnicity national, none of that yeah, how dark are you yeah so like <laughs> in our families in the yard somebody's like oye morena like yeah. morenita negrita like yeah. that's like well how we're referring to us yeah. and we come here and they're like girl uh-uh you're light-skinned move on yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's way different and then i think you were kind of getting to this point too of like you learn this now in school like we get to this point and we're like okay now i have to reassess where i'm coming from now i have to you know really understand what being dominican is what being black is how that all intertwines in this space and then you come home and you don't have that same experience because in college we're all a little bit more woke or a little bit more informed and you start really exploring that but then you go home and you can't bring that energy yeah. you can't bring that knowledge and you start talking about that stuff at home because that's like you're not talking about yeah. that here like don't bring all that college foo foo stuff <laughs> to this house yeah. it's not valid mm -hmm. you know what's funny is that in my household that was well received so like i spoke to my parents about these things but it didn't translate well to practice mm. although i will say i will say i gotta give a shout out to my mama because now she does not say pelo malo it Ooh, took a few a years movie. to train it, <laughs> and my mom is a hairstylist. That's a whole move. My mom is a hairstylist, and I got her to stop saying pelo malo and really understand what she was saying and what was coming out of her mm -hmm. mouth. I was like, do you really consider that I have bad hair? Think about people that can't curl their hair because their hair doesn't hold a curl. 
my hair can be straightened, my hair can be colored, my hair can be all these different things. Mm -hmm. So do I really have bad hair if it's so versatile and it can withstand that so it's strong? Think about the people that can't bleach their hair or it falls out. She's making a pitch for curly hair right now. <laughs> All I'm saying is that our view on what is good and what is bad when it comes to skin tone, texture, mm -hmm. and all these things is really, and he hates that I use the word subjective a lot, but I, it's very subjective to the perspective mm -hmm. in which you see it. Because okay. what is good to you is not necessarily bad for, is not necessarily good for me. I see where you're going, but I think it's also mostly just ignorance, if I'm being honest, because I kind of, when I talk about bad hair, good hair, I don't think there's a such thing either, and when people, like, talk to me about that, I explain to them that there's just different textures, and if you don't know how to handle it, just say that. Like, if you don't know how to manage that type of hair, that's okay. Just say that. It's not about the ba the hair being bad or anything like that, which kind of comes back to, like, the whole race issue or the whole being Afro-Latina. It's not that there isn't a such thing or that that doesn't exist or that we're not black. You just don't understand all of the different nuances and all the layers that go into it, and that's okay. We can learn about it. We could go into it, but it's just... I think it's more of, of an ignorance thing and of people not being educated to really understand how to manage all those different types of hair because I feel like all the different textures... But, I mean... Bad hair, good hair yeah, is a whole yeah, other yeah. topic, but yeah. you know. But even then, <laughs> I think there's there's this kind of double standard when it comes to what is good or bad. Mm -hmm. Because when it comes to hair, because it is more difficult to handle, it is bad, right? But when we're talking about something like maintenance of our well-being, just uh, your skin, your your diet, your fitness, whatever, all that stuff is... When, when you get really, uh, I guess, bougie, mm -hmm. it's very difficult. You know, you have different lotions, you have different uh, mm -hmm. different styles of clothing. Small you have <laughs> you, Yeah, you have you have a whole pantry full of different food, and it's it's very uh, tedious to, to do all that, but you're seen as uh, a better person because you do all that. Even though you're living a more difficult lifestyle as far as keeping up with it, mm -hmm. when it, when it becomes inconvenient for something to be difficult, now it's bad. So I, I think there the point is that kind of people choose, depending on what is convenient for them, what is good and bad. Absolutely. Yeah. So as far as code switching, because we never talked about that, what instances did you find yourselves using code switching? And for people that don't know, code switching is basically when you decide to, to put it simply, when you decide to speak or act a certain way in a certain environment. Personally, I feel like I have a customer service voice <laughs> all the time <laughs> all um, the time. because I feel like I I learned at a very young age that I have a very deep voice and I have a very aggressive tone. Naturally. See, I don't think you have a deep voice. I, you do have an aggressive tone, but I don't think your voice is like deep. Well, I was I always told deep. as a kid that it was deep. I was told that I sounded like a man. You see why so, how you it, talk to kids is important because I also yeah. was told that I had an attitude and I was so spicy and so and it's just like it's really <laughs> so spicy. Yeah, and it's just like it's really what people tell you that gets in your head and you don't want to talk anymore. Yeah. And none of those things matter. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. like aggressive, yes, but <laughs> yes, I but deep. I, I think because of the aggression, people just are like, you can't have an aggressive and high pitched voice, so they just uh, associated deep with the aggressive tone. Yeah, so... Don't make believe, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so growing up, having felt those things, so I thought I had a deep voice, and I, I'm not going to say I thought I had an aggressive tone. I knew I had an aggressive tone. I know that I'm a very forward, upfront person, mm -hmm. and a lot. So when I would speak to people over the phone... It became this thing where I didn't want you to think that I was yelling at you. Or Hi, this is Jennifer for Polino or whatever you're calling me about. I just, you know, I'm, yes, I'm, that, I'm at your service. Yes, that's exactly how I sound. <laughs> Why are you so good at that? <laughs> also, that is how I write my emails. Yes. Because the way that I speak to people and the way that I express myself to people, I want it to come off as non confrontational. Because the true reality of the matter is for me, code switching is not about how I will be perceived, it's about how I perceive myself. Okay. Mm. So, how I perceive myself is I am a lot. I know that I'm a lot. Pandora's box. <laughs> um, and the reason I say that is, if I open my mouth to speak, I'm very intentional because I've thought about what I was going to say. Or if not, I feel very strongly about what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. So it's either going to come off as I know it all or it's going to come off as I feel attacked and I need to protect myself. 
it's going to be one or the other. So I'm very intentional about the tone and the verbiage that I use to deliver it so that other people don't feel like I'm coming for them mm-hmm. or that I'm or I'm misinterpreted. So that that's why I speak in a very particular way or I switch the dialogue because I'm projecting kind of how you're going to receive it, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. So do you, you sp- okay, so do you feel like you code switch or you feel like this has become your regular voice? <laughs> that is my regular voice. Yeah. yeah. No, but she, did, it, say, she like, did this I, on the first episode too where I, the very first question I asked her it was about cartoons and she was like, um, well, my, I'm, like, I feel like my cartoons are, and then I'm like, I'm, and I'm like <laughs> looking at her, I'm like, please like do not talk like this for the rest of the episode. <laughs> no, you see, I think that's really funny. But, no, it's like a natural thing for me. It's but like, it has become a natural thing. Yeah. I actively cold switch all the time. Mm. And I wouldn't say that it's in, I guess, in order to make myself like be perceived better for my perception. I think it's more strategic for me than anything else. Like yeah. I cold switch based on the space that I'm in, in order to like, I don't, wouldn't say fit in, but it just depends, like, the vibe. I feel like I can, like a chameleon, like, you know it's kind of there, but, like, it's blending in. Yeah, like, you yeah. know it's a little different, but it's <laughs> yeah. blending in. Yeah. And I think that that's, I, that's just how I function yeah. if I'm in a workspace, especially, I think, being Hispanic and having an accent and, like, being expected to be, like, so flamboyant and extra yeah. all the time, I try to, like, manage myself in different spaces. So if I'm at work, I'm going to try to tone it down. And, like, now we're in a job where, like, there's Hispanics all around us and we're with around our people. So we can kind of be a little bit more of ourselves yeah. to put a little bit more of that into that space. But it depends on who I'm talking to. But also, it's kind of like we were talking about earlier about kind of feeling like you have to be black or white or, mm-hmm. like, kind of mix into those things. Being, we've mentioned this, like being Hispanic, you're kind of a mix of it all. Yeah. So I feel like I get to use that in every space that I'm in. Like if I'm in a more like black space, I'm, I, and I wouldn't say that I'm acting. I would say that I'm being more of myself in that aspect. Yeah. Right. Like I'm leaning more into that side of myself. Yeah. If I'm in a wider space or anything like that, I'm leaning a little bit more into that side of things. Mm-hmm. Same thing with being like it. Honestly, I don't know if you've noticed, like, it's a difference between being, like, around us. Well, I wouldn't say us. Like, being around a diverse group of people and being around Dominicans. Yeah, Your accent yeah, yeah. gets crazy. You start yeah, different, yeah. different refranes. You start getting, like, real in there. How does, and, like, like, class play into that for you then? Because, for example, for me, ah, that's a good question. there's a level of... So, I was raised in a very... By two campesinos, right? Mm-hmm. By definition of where they were raised. Right, but my so, mom. Campesinos, if we're gonna, we gotta translate that, right? Campesinos are country people folk. that country folk, <laughs> but country folk in our culture is a lot different than culture country <laughs> folk in American yeah. culture. <laughs> no, but no, no, no. It's no. that same. It's that same kind of like you know back roads environment. Yeah, very low education, very like mm-hmm. just forward. Uh- Okay, sorry. I was just like, here, that's not always the case about being country. Well, yeah, but, but that's yeah. Di- well, yeah. country now is different. Yeah. Country's yeah. now bougie. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, traditionally, country yeah. folk yeah. were, like, farmers and, yeah, like, people yeah. that couldn't afford to go to school. Get yeah. Educated. yeah. Like, yeah. that's really what Campesino and DR is. So, for me, being my dad, both my parents were raised in a similar environment, but my mom was very what you can consider bougie and very, like, like... I don't want to say, like, high-class etiquette. She had high standards. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, the way... Like, she was the type of person that knew where the fork went, if it went on the right or the left, yes, and what training. cups you had to yeah. use. Like, and she took an etiquette class. Mm-hmm. Like, she did. My mom yeah. was very, like... And I... The concept of etiquette, to me, is just, like, why does that exist? Mm-hmm. But that's a different... Whole nother conversation. But my dad was very much, like, a fork is a fork like why do i need a different <laughs> fork for a salad a grill is a grill yeah like he's like no why do i feel. need two forks for the salad and my mom was like because there's this kind of salad and, you know so being raised in both of those environments for me i felt like there was certain language that mm-hmm. you had to use regardless of whether i was speaking to dominicans blacks or whites like okay. even when i speak with dominicans there is a level of like I have to watch out if I'm using too many I's in place of an R and am I adding too many S's to the ends of my words, like proper language and proper tone because of my mom, even when I'm speaking to Dominicans. Okay. Whereas some people are like, oh, 
Dominicano, somos pana. I'm like, I, that never felt natural to me. I yeah. could never speak like that. Yeah. But, like, my brother does speak like that. And I've never felt comfortable speaking like that. Yeah. I feel yeah. like it's, sorry. I feel like it's an exposure because I feel like in English, I can do that. Like, I can kind of switch, like, I guess classes, code switch for classes, too. But I don't have, I don't have the language yeah. to do that in Spanish. Yeah. Like, I really don't. And honestly, I, I probably had an opportunity to get it and I didn't want to because I thought that I would be made fun of. Like, I was, like, so bad at my Spanish classes. And I was like, I'm not going home talking like that. Like, I'm not doing that. Like, my, if I come home being like, el casillero, <laughs> se cerró, my family's going to be like, like no la laca, you mean? Like, what are you talking about? So, yeah. like, I personally didn't do that, but for the opposite reason, because I was like, I'm going to get made fun yeah. of if I come home trying to act bougie.